Welcome to The Lover's Hole, where we are rereading our favorite novels, the Jack Aubrey, Stephen Matron books of Patrick O'Brien. You're with Mike and Ian, and we are delighted to have you on this journey to Pulo Prabang with us. Ian, can you catch us up on where we left off and where we're headed? Uh, with pleasure, Mike. Last time on the journey to Pulo Prabang, a, a fictitious Malay island somewhere in the South China Sea, the Diane, the frigate carrying Stephen and Jack and all the rest of them, was almost drawn into inaccessible island, saved by the wind at the last minute. Jack was finding that he was missing the, the letter of Mark character of the surprise, missing her crew, missing a little bit of that independent life he'd had there. The Diane's crew had, meanwhile, got much better at servicing the great guns. They'd sailed through a storm and hung together as a crew, sailed past mountains of ice with limited water. And the envoy that they're carrying to Pulu Prabang, this guy, Mr. Fox, had started getting on the nerves a little of Jack and Stephen, and the crew had clearly grown to dislike him. Stephen had managed to avoid hearing a personal and potentially quite intimate confession from Fox, likely about his sexuality, just as they had cited Java Head. So, Mike, this time, as we're closing in on Pulo Prabang, we're going to meet Stamford Raffles, Governor of Java, Lieutenant Governor of Java, in fact, at the time. We're going to pick up some additions to the British mission that's heading out to Pulo Prabang. We're going to hear troubling news about Britain's banks. We're going to follow the trail of the Dutch anatomist Van Buren, and we're going to establish regional banking ties. There's going to be plenty of nature. We're getting ready to press on to Prula Prabang to help us make sense of the political and historical context. We also have a great interview this episode with Josh Proven, author and blogger on all things Napoleonic, coming up later in the episode. I can't wait to get to Josh's interview and for you guys to hear that. He was just a delight to work with, and I learned so much there. But as we were ending last chapter, chapter five, Stephen was thinking, he was sort of seeing how Fox interacted with his melee servants, and he thought, you know, maybe maybe Fox will be a little bit more agreeable once he's in this element. And sure enough, he was much more agreeable on land. And the Diana stops to replenish her stores, in, including... O'Brien points out Arak, the local alcoholic liquor made from a coconut palm or rice sap, Very you know, important. and she's off kind of a ways from where they're going to meet raffles and everything. So she's away. They're going to have to travel inland to get there. And Fox takes Jack and Stephen on this journey into the big city, into the country home of Governor Stanford Raffles. Raffles is delighted to meet them. And I love how how O'Brien sets us up. You know, the first thing that Raffles says to him says, for if I do not mistake, sir, you are the gentleman to whom we owe Testudo Aubrey. And good heavens, now that I come to reflect, perhaps the captain is that glorious reptile's godfather. What a delight to have two famous names under our roof at the same time. And he's, you know, he's hollering for his wife to come meet them. <laughs> and he, he then kind of apologizes. He says, uh, you know, let me invite you to this large dinner that we're about to host. Uh, but tonight we're going to have a private supper together here. Ah, oh, fantastic. It's quite something. The lines of communication in the early 19th century world, Raffles has heard of Testudo Aubrey and heard of Aubrey. Fantastic. We'll, we'll, we'll take that. We'll take that. Sir Stamford Raffles, of course, Sir Thomas Stamford Bingley Raffles, to give him his full name, as we're going to hear shortly in our interview with Josh, was indeed the Lieutenant Governor of Java at the time. He was indeed in real life a renowned naturalist. He was going to go on and have a role in founding the famous London Zoo that now still exists in Regent's Park, and was what you can comfortably call a larger-than-life character in that part of the world at the time. According to Wikipedia... There is a life-size figure in white marble created by sculptor Sir Francis Chantry that depicts Raffles in a seated position. This is in Westminster Abbey in London. And that, that's a spot that's reserved for people who have or had a pretty high profile in, in the country and the empire. The sculpture was completed in 1832. So Raffles was going to stick around to be well known at least a couple of decades after where we are in the timeline here. The inscription on the statue reads, to the memory of Sir Thomas Stamford Raffles, 
LLD, Doctor of Laws, FRS, Fellow of the Royal Society, Lieutenant Governor of Java, First President of the Zoological Society of London, born 1781, died 1826. Selected at an early age to conduct the government of the British conquests in the Indian Ocean by, says the inscription, wisdom, vigour and philanthropy, he raised Java to happiness and prosperity, again, according to the inscription on the tombstone, unknown under former rulers. After the surrender of that island to the Dutch and during his government in Sumatra, he founded an emporium at Singapore, where in establishing freedom of person as the right of the soil and freedom of trade as the right of the port, he secured to the British flag the maritime superiority of the eastern seas, which we were duly going to keel over for not much, uh, not much hard work in 1942. Never mind. Ardently attached to science, he laboured successfully to add to the knowledge and enrich the museums of his native land. And you can see some more of that in the British Museum. In promoting the welfare of the people committed to his charge, he sought the good of his country and the glory of God. And, and, and Mike, what, what are your thoughts as you, you take a look at that inscription there? Well, it's interesting, you know, as, as Josh is going to talk about, you know, there's a, a lot of divided opinion on Raffles and his legacy. But, you know, one of the things that kept coming back to me is, you know, for somebody who was born on his father's West Indies trading ship, you know, literally born on the ship, and, and O'Brien references that in the book, and who started his career as an East India Company clerk at 14 because he had to support his mother and four sisters, that's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, he had a little bit of schooling, but he actually learned all the sciences and, and all his languages on his own with self-study. And that, you know, I take my hat off. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, indeed. Well, we're going to hear some more about where he was situated and what the interests of uh, expansion and empire were like in the region at the time when we get to talk to Josh. For now, we're back with Stephen and Jack and the company. They're sitting down to dinner at Raffles's mansion. Everyone is seated precisely according to precedence, which is a very traditional way of you know, putting the, the most senior, the most uh, noble, if you like, at the top of the table and so on down. Stephen's neighbor is the governor's financial advisor. And you're probably all remembering that we've heard already some kind of drum beats about the health and stability of Stephen's financial interests back home. This financial advisor asks Stephen to support him in telling the advisor's cousin, a merchantman's captain, not to listen to the latest news from London about (gasps) great losses on the stock exchange and (gasps) another gasp, the failure of many banks, particularly country banks, meaning not the old city names, but the newer country banks. This news we learn is only three months old. The advisor, however, believes it's been exaggerated by the time and distance that it's traveled to reach them. So there's this rumor going around that banks are failing. Mike, we don't know yet exactly what Stephen's going to make of it, but it's funny how O'Brien's introduced this potentially bad news in a sort of backhand way by asking one person to tell somebody else something that's not quite true. You know, classic O'Brien manipulation. Yeah, and and it's interesting because apparently, you know, at the same dinner, Jack was seated because he's captain, you know, at much uh, further away from Stephen at the table. He's heard the same thing. So he find Stephen as they're all kind of standing around having coffee together after the dinner. And he quietly tells him that he hopes Stephen did not take his financial advice and move his money to Smith's bank. And mm-hmm. Jack had heard a lot about bank failures at dinners and Smith's bank was particularly named as one that had gone under. And as you said, Ian, we remember, you know, Stephen saying, you know, I'm getting a lawyer to write this. I'm going to make sure my money gets moved. So I'm thinking, Oh no. But then, Right as we're about to sort of dwell on that tragedy, Jack says, and I also learned that the French have already reached Pulo Prabang. So, you know, they had been hurrying on, hurrying on, trying to get there first before the French could kind of seal up a deal. And now we know ah, the French mission has already arrived. And we wonder, you know, it's left us hanging on two things in this short paragraph. What in the world is going to happen with our mission? What in the world's happened to Stephen's fortune? Yeah, yeah. Which of these two bits of potentially bad news is going to play out? Which of them is going to get undercut? And right. Which of them are we just going to completely forget about? Yeah. There you go. 
Well, it wouldn't be Stephen Matron and it wouldn't be Raffles if we didn't have Raffles taking Stephen around to look at all his collections of plants and birds and animals. And Stephen takes the time to ask him about Van Buren, that Dutch naturalist that he had asked Fox about. And Fox had said, you know, ask Raffles. And Raffles says, yes, Van Buren is in Pula Prabang. Stephen said, you know, oh, did he move there when we, you know, when we took Java back? And he says, no, no, no. He moved there because his wife is Malay and he wanted to be closer to or the orangutans and gibbons and some very specific plants and animals there. Had nothing to do with the English taking Java. That in fact, Van Buren dislikes Bonaparte and like many other Dutch officials is working with the British. So, you know, they, they go through and, and Stephen's in all of these orchids and, and the plants, the birds of paradise aviary. And Stephen says, you know, all right, I, I've heard a little bit about, you know, your, your conversation with the Royal Society and this idea about a zoological society for London. I'm completely in favor of it. So they're, they're you know, it's, it's a real nice mutual admiration society. And then Raffles says, well, you know, I, I don't know that you need it, but I'd be delighted to give you a letter of introduction to Van Buren. But then Stephen thinks, well, wait a minute. Uh, and, and he talks to Raffles and Raffles knows Stephen's kind of secret role in this mission. Yeah. And they agree that, you know, it's better for Stephen just to go find Van Buren himself because he's trying to really pose as a naturalist, not as a government official. So he doesn't want any official letter that might draw some attention to his government interests. Yeah. And maybe there might have been a question mark around a, a British official introducing uh, a British citizen to a Dutch person, a member of the uh, the state that had just recently been kind of turned out by the British. Anyway, we, we, learn, we learn that you know, Van Buren's still in pretty good odor with the British, and he's just happy doing his naturalizing thing. And S- Stephen goes on. He thinks there's more that he can get from this conversation with Raffles, and he asks for a recommendation and an introduction to a merchant who can handle bills of exchange. And Mike, we, we've seen this before, that Stephen finds himself in a place where he can suborn or manipulate national interest, and he's doing it the quiet, stealthy way with influence and information and cash. Right. Now, on, on this occasion, fortunately, the Diane's hold was not necessarily stuffed with jewels and bearer bonds like, uh, like he ended up with a couple of books ago. But he's out here and he needs to find some way of converting this, the treasure that he's brought with him into a form that he can use locally. He wants to be able to disperse pretty significant sums of money quite discreetly in Pulo Prabang. He says he'd rather deposit sums here and get out to Pulo Prabang as a man of substance from the outset not as a mere moneyed adventurer. So he's trying to put himself in good odor with what you might call the banking establishment here in Java. And he hopes that Raffles can introduce him to a, a, a man, a merchant, who will confer Stephen's enhanced status, that is to say status of being moneyed and also being well-placed with the government, um, to, to this correspondence so that Stephen can operate confidentially and maybe also use the correspondent's discretion to get some extra access to valuable information. Now, Raffles is very happy at this stage to introduce him to a Chinese merchant. They talk a little bit for a while about which one and how prominent and how discreet, and they choose Xiao Yan as the choice. So Mike, in in a few paragraphs, Stephen seems to have pushed on several open doors at once. He's got influence with Raffles. He's got connection to an anatomist, Van Buren, and he's got connection to a Chinese money exchange merchant guy he's he's in great shape here yeah and and you know i think we're starting to see that this isn't shipping up to be a great naval adventure at the moment right right, 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 right. <laughs> uh, so yeah nobody's talked about where to place the cannons nobody's talked about supplies of gunpowder or spars or cordage or anything else like that right right so Stephen here is trying to collaborate with raffles in creating and extending british influence in the far east but before we go deeper into how they're going to work together, Mike, this is probably a good time to find out some more about the politics of Britain and France in the region, find out about their patterns of influence in the Far East, and maybe a little bit more about the real life character and context for this guy Raffles. So this would be a great time to hear our interview with Josh Proven. We're really excited to welcome to the show today, Josh Proven, uh, internet historian, YouTuber, um, and 
Mm, writer in particular about some of what's going on with European nations colonizing and exploring the countries of Southeast Asia. Welcome, Josh. It's great to have you with us. It's great to be here, guys. It's been so looking forward to doing this. Josh, again, also, thank you for being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you came to be interested in military history of the Regency era. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a fan both of the podcast and the books. I guess... The things you need to know about me is that I'm an author, an artist, and uh, as they call it nowadays, a content creator uh, online. I'm from the UK, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to write books, and I can fill you in about those later on. But um, what got me into this period uh, would be when I was a little kid, uh, playing soldiers with my dad and my brother. You know, we had the actual physical toy soldiers. We didn't nice. have video games. Um, and just chaotic battles where there were no rules, and you just knock down each other's soldiers and make the noises with your mouth, play outside. Uh, and these were usually fueled by movies we'd seen. You know, you see the movie when you're a kid and you want to play, play. you want to be those people. So in this case, obviously, it was Waterloo, 1971, okay. when oh. I was finally allowed to watch it. Wow, <laughs> wow. I was just like, uh, the Redcoats and the Highlanders coming over the hill, and Christopher Plummer is Wellington. Yeah, that was that was me. And it all snowballed from there because you wanted to make the games better. Uh, and the only way to make the games better is to add reading about it and you know, getting yeah. Osprey books and things like that that have the pictures that get into your mind and, and stuff like that. And that got me into telling stories. And you have to still research to tell the stories and you know, snowball effect from there. Here we are. So I think you've already said that you're a fan of the O'Brien books. Tell us about how they came into your world. What do you want to say about joining the fandom of Patrick O'Brien? Uh, I was a little late at joining the fandom of Patrick O'Brien. Okay. Um, I was a little late to maritime fiction, generally speaking. I was a land lover for quite a long time. Uh, although, thinking back, you know, a lot of the adventure stories I would read, like Kidnapped and stuff like yeah. that, were actually had heavy maritime themes and Treasure Island and things. Yeah, right. But you didn't notice it because it's more about the pirates and the smugglers and stuff. Yeah. But... Um, I had started to read Alexander Kent. I'd read like three books of Alexander Kent, uh, the American Revolution ones. Yeah. Right. And I'd also read some Dudley Pope. Um, yeah. I like books. Yes, yes. Although I think they were the Buccaneer ones that I actually read uh, mm. with Ned or something yeah. as the hero. And I, but my favorite books at the time uh, were the Alan Mallinson books, the cavalry books, because mm. I love horses. And I recommend them to all horsey people who like also like history. But on the on the back of them, he's r routinely called the heir to Patrick O'Brien and C.S. Forrester. Ah, yeah. Now, that was in my head, but a family friend was reading the O'Brien books, and uh, he recommended them to me. So one day I got, you know, Master and Commander. I'm just holding up the book right now for no, those right. who can't, can't see. And I started reading it, and everybody in the series will know that it's a slow start. But the quality was good enough that I stayed with it, and I did this slow slow sort of roll to HMS Surprise. And I, I think it's HMS Surprise where the debauched sloth appears, is it? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Yeah. 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 And when that happened, I laughed out loud like a fool <laughs> in an empty room. No, only a handful of books have ever made me do that. Nice. And from then on, it's like, these are the best historical fiction ever. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. So we, we thank Alan Mallinson and the debauched sloth. In fact, Alan Mallinson <laughs> uh, tells a story about how he, Patrick O'Brien gave him his start. He wrote a letter to Patrick uh, O'Brien, mm -hmm. and O'Brien wrote back yeah. and said, these cavalry stories you have are, are, are really good. They're my sort of thing. I'm right. going to put you in touch with a publisher and I'm going to tell him to help you. Wow. Oh, Fantastic. brilliant story. And uh, we, we follow Alan Mallinson on Twitter as well. He's great on Twitter. He's he is well. brilliant. He's a really nice guy as well. Yeah. Right. Josh, I, I know some of your interests uh, include the expansion of the British Empire to the east. And, and you're just curious, what, what kind of got you interested in that subject in that era? I, I, I dot around a lot, so it's very difficult for me to to pinpoint stuff like this exactly. But let's put it this way. You can't study British military history uh, without 
ending up in the East at some point. Mm. And I was very much into British military history to begin with, i.e., you know, circling back to the soldiers and playing games and stuff. And, you know, so I wanted to, I wanted to write novels to begin with. I still do want to write novels. And I was, you know, set it in a war, do a battle every book kind of thing idea. So I would research battles and stuff. And you end up in the East an awful lot. Also, I'm a massive fan of the Duke of Wellington. You know, ah. I admire his sort of life and career very, very much. And he obviously, he, he learned his soldiering in India. So I was introduced to the British and the, uh, the British messing around in very dubious ways uh, in the East through Wellington. And um, there you find out about all these sort of crazy schemes and campaigns, and people and places you've never uh, heard about before. And stories that don't get uh, told very often, except in novels uh, and and things like that. So that's probably where my interest in in the British in the East comes in. Yeah, it's funny because we're we're starting off heading to South America, but you know then it's like wait wait pause we're you know we've got to send you off um, to the Far East, and and we've got this whole thing with Britain trying to outdo the French. You know, who have, have recently outdone the Dutch, I guess. Can you tell us a little bit about what was going on in that region and why these three powers were so interested, Jack? Well, I can do my best. Uh, the, you know, books have been written on, these, on the subject of what right. the Europeans are, are doing out there. Um, first of all, I think it's a, a very, very clever twist to the plot of 13 Gun Salute, to think you're going to go in the South American adventure and, you know, get involved with all the pre-revolutionaries out there. Uh, and then to say, oh, hang on, we're still allied with Spain right now. We can't really be messing around with this. So yeah. we have to reroute you for political right. reasons. That's very clever. But yeah, and it makes a lot of sense. And I'm so glad he did that. Because again, it's one of these underserved areas of history is is Southeast Asia. I mean, India gets a fair amount of press. Mm-hmm. The further east you get at this point, the less people care, unless you're Dutch. Yeah, it tends to get lost, doesn't it, uh, between China and India. Yeah. Really, it's this pocket that kind of gets referenced, but isn't isn't really sort of in people's minds as important. But it was ma- it was massively important because it was like the spice and wood hub for, to begin with uh, for Europe. I mean, it, for for any anyone who maintained a fleet out there, the teak forests that grew in Southeast Asia were massively important for repairing the India East India fleets and the Dutch had East mm. India fleets and the British had East India fleets and the French had the Compagnie des Indies and, you know, whatever. So that was massively important and very lucrative. Uh, and it was called the, it was good to remember as well that the British tended to refer to it as the Dutch East Indies at that time. Yeah. Right. Um, because they had the massive, I don't know if massive is the proper word, but it's like they had big trading centers in the islands of Indonesia and into Malaya and all across that area because they had supplanted the Portuguese oh, as sort of the trade kings right. of, of the East, even as far as Japan. Nobody got into Japan except right. the Dutch. Well, they nobody was allowed to stay in Japan except for the Dutch, right. you know? Um, so that, that in itself shows you how sort of powerful the Dutch were. Yeah. But then comes the Age of Revolution, and they practically bankrupt themselves financing the American Revolution. The Dutch East India Company has to get taken over by the government in the 1790s, I think. And so they have a decline. Now, the British, they've been trying to cultivate bases in this part of the world since the 17th century and been failing miserably. Partially because the French and the Dutch were just so much better at cultivating alliances. Yeah. Um, and now, uh, with the Napoleonic Wars going on, they have this opportunity to get in by basically at legally attacking the Dutch and the French, uh-huh. who by t- who by turns are allied or subservient. Because at first the the Dutch um, uh, form a republic of their own, I believe, yeah. and then that gets sort of and they get annexed by Napoleon. So fair game, basically, yeah. from South Africa to java all of that is fair game for the royal navy now and it's really really important that they needed to do this because the east india company the british east india company is in serious financial trouble and it always has been 
uh, for for like d- several decades now, it's been in trouble. The only thing keeping it alive alive is the trade from China. And the islands of uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, as you know, we'll get to, are supremely important for the trade from China because they're they're kind of a physical barrier, aren't they? To, exactly. To, head to the exactly. To access to the South China Sea. Uh, so yeah, that's what they want. That's why we're they're there, and a familiar pattern in sort of colonial warfare sort of breaks out at this time where with raids and larger scale limited invasions and stuff taking place so there's, a, there's it's it's a novelist paradise basically nice. yeah, well put. All, all those interests kind of overlapping and competing right now i want to talk about the geography just for a second i, I know that you're not a geographer but let's, let's think about this because O'Brien in the books is giving these places the, the the names of the time we talk about java and batavia and the malay states Remind us, where are we in terms of you know, the geography that we know about in the 21st century? I'll do my best, um, because <laughs> the, there are a lot of, because there are the European powers and there are sort of the sultanates and, yep. and stuff like that. And it's very, it's very confusing. Um, but for podcasting purposes, we'll try and keep it simple. So the first thing to fix in your mind, of course, is what we were just talking about, the, that route from Canton to Calcutta is what you want to keep in mind. That's a loop basically uh from from north to north to north basically you go south do a loop and go back up north to do that route to or from china from india you have to pass through the strait of malacca uh now the strait of malacca is a narrow passage that is formed by the malaysian peninsula and the indonesian islands and the, as you were saying before the indonesian islands form a barrier to the Indian Ocean for anyone coming from the south. Yeah. And you have to get through that channel if you're coming from the India side as well, because you obviously you can't come down under them yeah. unless you want to go all the way out towards, I guess, New Guinea and, and whatnot. Yeah. Mm. So that's why that's really important in that sort of you know trading geopolitical thing I was talking about before, where the British need the China trade. Therefore, they need to control the Straits of Malacca. They need a big powerful port controlling that where their ships can protect their Indian, the East India convoys. Now, Batavia is both (laughs) confusingly the name the Dutch call Java, or at least the slang for Java, and also the name of the Dutch principal city there, which is now Jakarta. Um, So that's where that is. Uh, So therefore, it's on the main island of the Indonesian chain, the big long one. Uh, yeah. that sort of runs west to east, uh, which is currently called Java and forms part of Indonesia and holds, I believe, half of the population of Indonesia. Yeah, which um, is Yes, mm-hmm. it's quite large, yeah. <laughs> now, the Malaysian states are much more confused. The population is contained in a series of sultanates like Aka and Kande and things like that. And they have been subservient to the Dutch for a very long time, and they essentially are trying to get the best deal out of the Europeans because they're not going away. Right. Mm. So the British are basically just trying to take over the Dutch influence in those areas. In Malaysia, like I said, they hadn't had very good luck with it. They had founded places in Penang and a couple of other ones that hadn't worked out. One one up in the Mergui Peninsula uh, that had got basically flooded out and people got massacred back wow. in the uh, early 18th century, I believe. Because the wh- one of the main things that the Europeans tried to do in the 17th century was to try and get into Siam, modern Thailand. But mm. the, the Siamese, uh, as they were then, had a revolution around 1688, much like the British, uh, where they decided we're just going to close the country down and kick out all the foreigners, which was a very wise decision, really, when it comes down to it, uh, because then they just basically they can uh, they don't they don't have uh, this this colonial baggage uh, that, a, that a lot of other nations have. So that's the nutshell of the geography, I guess. Yeah. Um, if, if that helps at all, or maybe it just yeah. confuses. <laughs> no. Well, thank you. I think it puts it into context the, the confusion that you can easily pick up on as you try to mm-hmm. read and decode and make sense of all the place names. 
one of the characters that are involved in the British steadily trying to get a stronger foothold is Stamford Raffles. And I always associate the name Raffles with Singapore for some reason. Right. Um, t- tell us about Raffles, because he seems like a pretty colourful character. He-, he occurs in a book, but he's clearly also a real life you know, mm. part of this the history of this region. Yes, uh, you're very right to associate his name with Singapore, not only because of the large, luxurious hotel exactly, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> called, called Raffles, <laughs> But that is there named after him because he is considered the founder of, of modern Singapore. Okay. But he, so he was absolutely one of the sort of the founders of the British Empire in the east, further further east, you might call it. And as well as founding Singapore, uh, he was massively associated with everything that goes with the British expansion in the east, good and bad. Essentially, he's because, as you say, he's the name everybody knows. Yeah. in Southeast Asia, connected with the British, even though he was fairly early on when it comes to the, the span of British control there. Um, he was a naturalist and a collector, so obviously someone that Stephen would get yeah. along quite well with. Uh, he was, uh, I think, either he was part of or founder of, I think, the Linnaeum uh, Association uh, okay. uh, in Britain uh, when he came back. Yeah. And he, he was, he's very interesting. He's, he's almost as if Patrick O'Brien had made him up. He, he was born on a ship in, a, in the Caribbean. And he was then sort of placed into the East India Company as a young man. And he ended up going out to Penang, which was at that point thought to be like the, the, going to be the, the big boom town in Southeast Asia. And he then got involved in trying to find a, a solution to how to continue the, and secure the China trade. And he was involved in the planning for the invasion of Java as a result, mm. um, which is the biggest operation in South Asia in the Napoleonic Wars, which occurred in 1811. 11,000 British troops uh, descended on Java, which was at that time technically French because the French had annexed the Dutch and Republic, and therefore, technically speaking, it was like an arm of the Napoleonic Empire. So mostly Dutch troops and some French colonial troops landed from ships and things, um, and commanded by some French officers and some Dutch officers. Okay. Uh, but it was a, it's, it's a big, big, massive operation. It's very interesting if you want to sort of read about colonial warfare and things like that. He was, he was involved in the planning for that. He, like many others, identified... We can't be messing around west of the Malacca Strait. The west in Malaysia won't cut it. We need something directly guarding the Malacca Strait, and Java mm-hmm. and Jakarta does that brilliantly. Now we're at war with them. We have an opportunity to take that. And the other thing, the reason it was taken would be the traditional reason you take colonies in the 18th century, and that is it's a bargaining chip for when the peace breaks out. And okay. you say, I took this, you took that, I've taken that, you've taken that. Swapsies, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was a, that, that's, that's a very sort of um, traditional thing that happens in, in this time. And from Java, he became governor of Java. Um, he, he set his sights on where Singapore now is and developed a major settlement there. Although he only spent eight months there himself. Oh, wow. Um, he's considered the founder of it because it was his idea to put something there, basically. Uh, he didn't actually like make it what, it what it became, but it was his idea to put something there. And unlike all the other guys who had been supposedly foresighted in, you know, <laughs> uh, placing colonies in various places that failed, he actually identified that these places would be good for trade and defense and stuff like that. So that's, that's Raffles as a deal. He is a controversial guy. People have in his own time, people didn't know what to do with them. Some people thought he was brilliant. Some people thought he was awful, too ambitious. The argument goes on today. Uh, but you know, there are books out there for you to read, but like by, uh, by Victoria Glendening, which yeah. is 
behind me, I believe. Which you review on your website, I think. <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I reviewed on I reviewed the Glenn Dunning book on my website, sure. and that's a good book. There are there are a couple to choose from that take pro and pro and against stances. A couple of middle of the road ones, but this is the point: he's dead, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, he's right. Dead. Make up your own mind. Hmm. Read the books about him. If you like him, you like him. If you don't like him, you don't like him. Yeah. Same as same as when he was alive. Um, right. But he's an interesting, very very interesting man, and definitely. I, I can see why Patrick O'Brien wanted to have him as a character in the book. You were just talking about Swapsies a, a minute ago. And it's it's interesting kind of building off of that point, Josh, that in 13 Gun Salute, we don't see a lot of military action, but we do have a lot of politics, a lot of intrigue, a lot of spying. And, and we're kind of curious, is that, you know, in order to give Stephen Matron a role to play, or was that kind of, you know, the order of the day? Was there a lot of that going on? Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Patrick O'Brien. One of the things I like is about his books is that they're not all just like I'm going to kill everybody and I'm yeah. at the front of every charge and slaughter yeah. a thousand enemies before they get me, kind of thing. Um, it, that's really refreshing. It's like it's like a proper historical fiction doesn't have enough proper stories, mm, uh, yeah. <laughs> and he always gives you a proper story to yeah. care about before he gets into the fighting, and. 13 Gun Salute is a much more laid back kind of one of the filler books, almost, you might say, as they're going from one place to another. That's yeah. one of the great things about the series. Um, and again, it sort of it sort of circles back to when is this set? You know, mm. if it's 1811, then like I say, you have you should have a massive thing about the conquest of Java. Right. You know, uh, it must have been very brave of him to decide, no, I'm not going to involve them in a massive military campaign where... Theoretically, you'd have to invent a whole kind of mission for them to go on or something like that. That would be the traditional historical fiction thing, right? You know, you, you would you would invent some port or something that they have to raid or some vital thing that they do to pull off yeah, the right. invasion or something like that. But no, he, he said, I'm not going to get them lost in that with yeah. all these historical figures I'm going to have to you know interact with. He says, we're going to go in... After that, where the Dutch have been severely crippled, yeah. but they're still around, and there are French agents around trying to mess stuff up, and yeah, I actually do think it is probably to give you know Stephen something a, a bit more active to do, give him a bit of a book where he can right. show his talents. <laughs> there's that, you know. I don't know if we want to do spoilers here for anybody who hasn't watched it, but there's that that scene where he's disposing of the bodies right. yeah right, right, right. Yes. We, we don't have to mention yet which bodies but yes it's, right it's not, not my, go, my goodness right <laughs> love that love that uh yeah so i think i think that's the case to be honest yeah. um you can obviously read about military actions that were happening at this time in the second volume of Stamford raffles two volume history of java okay and uh, a chap called william thorne who is a soldier participated in the invasion of Java. Um, so you'll get a lot of sort of the military context from stuff like that if you want to do some reading yourself. Nice. But there's definitely a lot of sort of under-the-table dealings and and small ship actions and yeah. like that painting I, I showed on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, that was in 1811 as well. So definitely all the fighting happens mostly in 1811. But So it's, it's a nice, nice atmosphere, nice sort of environment to put yeah. a spy and a single frigate yeah, or I think it's Diane actually, isn't it? That's right, um, right. Or into this sort of world, and you can have a, a little adventure that isn't that doesn't cost too much. Yeah, nice. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Leaving the past, getting to the present and the future. How about you? What are you What are you working on now? And tell us a little bit more about you and what you're doing. Okay, well, so the books I have at the second, as I referenced before, uh, the first one I wrote, it came out just at the beginning of the pandemic. Wow. <laughs> uh, it was called Wild East, the British in Japan, uh, 1853, 1868. And that's a, that, was a lot, that book was a lot of fun to write. You can buy that from uh, Font Hill Media, still in print. Uh, would very much appreciate it. And you can see how the British got into Japan because we didn't have an in there for a while. Um, and then uh, my second book, which was published in 2021 by Helion and Company, is Bullock's Grain and Good Madeira, which is about the second Maratha War. 
and the ensuing Jat campaign. Uh, 1803-1806, that's uh, more straight military history. Um, you have the Duke of Wellington, you have Lord Lake, you have some, you have some dashing Maratha uh, generals, and that, again, had a lot of fun researching that. I hope to do more books on the British in Asia and maybe Southeast Asia now that I've, I've sort of got back <laughs> I've looked at it again. Yeah. Um, but at the second, I'm writing a book on the Spanish in the American Revolution, specifically the siege of Pensacola in 1781. Fantastic. Um, uh, and mm-hmm. that, is, that is in production. I'm hoping that I will be able to deliver it sometime in the summer of next year, which means it might be published by the end of 23. We'll see. And there are other things public publishing wise that's sort of hopefully going to happen. Uh, but you can also find me on Twitter uh, at land of history. Um, my blog is adventures in history uh, Mostly though, I would love it if people would subscribe to the YouTube channel because we're at 906 subscribers. Right. Ah, we want to get to the, we, want, right. we want to get to the one K. So, so tell us how to find you on YouTube, Josh. That's adventures in history land. Again. Okay. Okay. You should be able to find me that I believe that's what it's. I believe that's how you do you do YouTube. You can tell I'm really experienced. <laughs> <laughs> we, we we resemble that remark, right? <laughs> but exactly. <laughs> Join the club, but yeah, um, that I I do. Uh, at second, I'm basically doing conversations with people, hmm. chats about history, and a couple of videos I do myself. And that's what the channel is at the second. And if it's going somewhere, hopefully I'll be able to be a bit more, I don't know, adventurous with what I do. But uh, so far, I would appreciate, I would very, I much, very much appreciate if anybody just stops by, leaves a comment, says hi. You don't have to subscribe if you don't want to. Nice. Wonderful. Well, Josh, thank you very much. It's been really great to talk to you. I, I love this idea of adventures in history. There's so much adventure going on in the region, and um, thank you for bringing lots of those adventures to life for us. It's been great to talk to you today. Thanks again for coming on The Lover's Hole. Uh, I will be happy to come back anytime. It's been a delight. Great. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Boy, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Josh as much as as we did. Wow. I, you know, I learned so much, and th- the depth and breadth that, that Josh has at his mind and his fingertips just just outstanding. Thank you so much, yeah. Josh. Well, that's a lot to take all at once between our beginning of this chapter, the interview with Josh. I'd say I'm I'm about well, we're, you know, we're not at Singapore yet, but a Singapore sling would uh, would do me just fine about now. What do you What do you say? Ian? let's take a little break and then scoot back. Hey, man, I'm going to reach for the gin bottle and the Benedictine right now. If you're enjoying the podcast please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed your Singapore sling. Meanwhile, Stephen's not done yet in his collaboration with Raffles. He asks Raffles for more information on what's happening with the French mission and the Sultan's court in Pulau Praban. Now, we learned that the French frigate, which has already got there, as we heard a few paragraphs ago, has already been removed from the harbour because of the bad behaviour ashore of the French crew. Their leader, Duplessis, and we should stick a pin in his name for later on, will not actually get to meet the Sultan until after the change of the moon, when the Sultan is going to return from his trip away hunting the two-horned rhinoceros. Now, As Stanford reports, Fox knows all about the Sultan, but Raffles himself is going to see what information his own people have on the Sultan's chief advisors, his council. These are the people that Fox doesn't know very much about yet. And as they're continuing this conversation, Stephen and Raffles stop to listen to the gibbons on their way back into the dinner. And Raffles calls to one in particular, a siamang, which I think is the the largest gibbon species, big black gibbon native to the area, Arm span of five feet, which is almost as big as Awkward Davies. Right. Uh, this, gib- this gibbon apparently is called Frederick and, and responds, as O'Brien says in the text, with a melodious hoo hoo hoo. And this seems like Mike Stephen is pretty well in his happy place. He's got access to money, he's got intelligence, he's got connections with local scientists. 
And at dinner, joined by Jack, the conversation extends and we're talking about sea voyages. So everybody is pretty well set here. Yeah, yeah. Well, then we move on. Stephen goes to meet Xiao Yan, you know, this this merchant who, when Stephen first sees him, you know, looks really a lot more like a monk than a merchant, Stephen thinks. And Stephen explains his problem that, you know, he's going to be wanting to buy the goodwill of influential men in Pulu Prabang. And he's brought a bunch of, of literal gold to do it with. And so he's thinking, you know, I want to deposit the gold with you here. I don't want to kind of take it on the perilous rest of the, the journey with us. And then I want to go ahead and get that, have access to that gold when I get there. And Xiao Yan says, well, you know, I've got two correspondents in Pula Prabang, but if they scrape together all the gold they have, it's probably 10% of what you brought with you. Uh, yeah. But he says, 10% in gold tactfully presented should buy you all the influence you need. And and he says, you know, even given the competition there. So Cheyenne, you know, every everybody's a little bit aware of the, the British yeah. and the French are coming together here. Now, Cheyenne says, well, let me do this. You know, I'm going to give you a letter of credit for the gold and, you know, 10% of it so that you'll collect there and notes of hand for the other 90% of the value. And that will, you know, that will work very well there. And he's kind of saying, and, and I don't think you're going to need all of it. Yeah. Well, Stephen underscores the need for all of his transactions to be confidential, you know, among other things, as an intelligent agent, confidentiality is there. And as a good negotiator, he doesn't want to be squeezed by people who have gotten word of, of how much, you know, how high he could go here. So Xiao Yan decides, you know, he's got these two correspondents but he's going to direct them to the one who is really a less conspicuous correspondent. He has a smaller trading house, a little bit more out of the way. So Stephen will have that influence, but have it kind of in secret a little bit here. Xiao Yan's going to direct Stephen to Lin Liang, who is the less conspicuous correspondent with the smaller trading house. Mm, so on the one hand, Stephen's acquiring help from the governor and from inconspicuous, discreet, low-key local help. He's got some other help coming here that I think is a bit less discreet and certainly a lot more conspicuous. Stephen's around the place looking for Jack, learns that Jack has gone to Anger, which is where the Diane is taking in stores, and that they're going to sail the Diane directly into Batavia to save a bit of time. Stephen spends the afternoon, meanwhile, with Raffles' Javanese peacock, a civet, and with Mrs. Raffles, who's an, and he's admiring their dried arrangements. As all of this little domestic culture session is going on, Fox introduces Stephen to the three government officials, the inconspicuous ones, who are going to join the mission. And I love the description that O'Brien gives to these three guys. Tall, red, thick, arrogant, with booming voices and an inexhaustible store of platitudes. He's talking about me. Um, Fox, Fox, wants, Fox wants the English mission to look better than the French delegation. And this great description of these men, Fox says they can stand there in their gold-laced uniforms for hours without suffering. They can give the appearance of listening to speeches. They never have to steal away to the privy. And at banquets, they are capable of eating anything from human flesh downwards. But I admit that their company is a trial. And this is another one of these little swooning asides from Fox about oh, oh, how hard my tough life is. Right. And, and Stephen's right across this. He says, vous l'avez voulu, Georges Dandin. Um, you wanted it for yourself, Georges Dandin. Where does this come from, this little French tag here, Mike? Well, Moliere has a, a play, and, and in this play, Dandin marries above his station, and he gets cuckolded out of his pretty young wife, and he repeatedly mutters this phrase, and, and, and it's become kind of a way of saying, you know, you've only got yourself to blame for what you're complaining about. Like, yeah, you picked him, Fox. You know, you, yeah. you're going to have to live with him here. <laughs> you knew this would happen. Fox says that, yeah, it's okay. He can bear it for the journey and for the negotiations. You know, he can put up with being around these three loud, obnoxious guys because they'll, they'll help here. Because Raffles has told Fox, Fox tells Stephen, that a successful treaty might get Fox a knighthood, perhaps a baronetcy. And Stephen thinks and is about to say, you know, surely you're jesting. But Fox says, 
about how much that would please his mother. And Stephen realizes he's serious. Yeah. Oh, hmm. It's fascinating and very strange and ambiguous, this this guy Fox. In the previous chapter, we we started to learn that he's a pretty selfish, self-regarding person. In this chapter, he's kind of resourceful again because he's back out where the action needs to be. But then we get another swing back to this slightly conceited, self-regarding note again. It, uh, it really helps to maintain our curiosity, which, which is the real version of Fox. And just how much are all these tensions and contradictions in his character? How much are they going to harm? the story mm. later on mm. right anyway speaking of tension and confrontation jack arrives back in the batavia with the diane and sends an official note saying that they're going to sail in the morning at 11 a.m and bless him this is a real sign of how far Stephen has moved along in his ability to be trusted as a non-lover jack adds a private note to Stephen saying please be sure that everyone arrives promptly i suggest that you invite the governor to see the ship and four or five books ago, I think he would have found somebody else. He would have sent, you know, Bondon or Killick or someone to make sure everybody showed up on time. But he's trusting Stephen to make sure everyone shows up on time. Raffles is very happy with the visit. And as Jack hoped, the governor and the rest of the delegation show a leg, meaning get there in plenty of time. And the Diane looks beautiful. They're welcoming the governor. They're welcoming the envoy. One or two unsightly things are hidden beneath hammocks or behind the smoke of the 13-gun salute. Mike, I'm not sure if this is the first time in the book we've had the reference to the to the the eponymous 13 gun salute, but here it is, if you've been watching out for it. Jack entertains these guests. They're under an awning over part of the quarter deck. This all sounds very kind of nice and colonial and you know Singapore sling. Raffles asks for a tour of the ship. This is quite well on into the morning at 10:15, but Raffles does a really good job of asking intelligent questions, and we get reminded that he was born at sea himself and finishes up gathering his people and heading ashore so that Jack can depart on time with fair wind and tide. And uh, we, we don't get it directly, but you can imagine Jack going, thank heavens for an yes. organized, prompt, punctual, seaman-like person amongst all these land dwellers. Yeah, yeah, I think Jack says, like, you know, he's just so thankful for a guest that knows when to come and knows when to go. Oh, <laughs> it was yeah. brilliant. He loved it, right? Well, you know, later after everybody's left and they're they're underway, Stephen tells Jack, you know, he looks really worn. And Jack says, you know, I am worn. You know, all this watering and resupply at such a rapid pace, especially when all the hands that I need to be working kind of full time, all they want to do is, is be going ashore and playing around after months at sea. And that, in fact, even when they left, you know, they didn't have time to go you know, to all the body houses, uh, you know, where they were. So there's, they're 10 hands down. They had 10 people that they, you know, couldn't gather back up in time, but he's glad the sailing, Jack says, he's glad the sailing is going to be less anxious since at least for a while, they'll be sailing primarily over the waters that were in Captain Muffet's notes and logs. So right now they're going to be on that Indiaman route and he's happy for that. But his thought that he's going to have a less anxious sale might have been premature. It might have done indeed, because he now has his new uh, new supercargo to deal with. The three new guests named Johnston, Crab, and Loader, being specifically a judge and two council members whose rank was down to longevity and not merit. <sighs> They're not known to Jack. And he's he's learning a little bit about what it's going to take to survive life on board with these, these three characters. They're going through this really treacherous, shallow channel. They've only got three fathoms to spare. There's really, really in-depth, quite risky, quite careful pilotage to be done. And Johnston mentions in passing to Stephen that, you know, we all love a tune, but maybe enough is as good as a feast. He's kind of dropping a hint here that Stephen and Jack's nocturnal music making might be better off not taking place. And he says... He's certain that the captain doesn't realize that the music is keeping him, Johnston, awake and asks Stephen to drop a diplomatic hint. Well, if, if ever there was an ill-advised request for a hint, this is right up there in the top handful. Stephen, who's in a, a little aside to himself, reflects that he's never met a judge that he liked, <laughs> replies, well, surely you know that all good men from the earliest times disagree with this proposition. Uh, feasts in the ancient classics were neither prepared by fools nor eaten by them. And had Johnston known that Stephen is the captain's guest, he would never have supposed that, says Stephen, I could give him hints on how he should behave. 
And I'm right there with Stephen giving this guy a good old verbal slap back. But Johnston clearly takes it as the infront for which it's meant to be. He flushes with anger and says, well, I'm going to take care of it myself. So you start to wonder, is Johnston going to march up to Jack on the quarterdeck? Is he going to muscle his way in or will calmer heads prevail? Yeah, I, I I was just like you, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, here they are, uh, you know, within seconds of perhaps losing the ship at any minute, and this guy's going to go talk about this stuff. Uh, you know, what's going to happen here? But in fact, he doesn't go talk to Jack directly as the ship continues to thread its way through this narrow strait. But Jack, you know, he's running down to check some of the notes that Muffet had left behind, and he overhears Killick telling Bonded about those old buggers, as these three guys get come to be known, these old buggers carrying on about the captain's music. So after they anchor for the night, Jack asks to call on the envoy, Mr. Fox, and he and he tells him that you know he's had no idea how much of a din they're making, and Fox is like confused a little bit and then he realizes that jack means the music and, and fox says no no you know even though I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of music because i can't tell the notes it's not a problem for me i use these little balls of wax i'm great and jack says well you know your companions and fox is very apologetic he says you know jack has been so very kind arranging their quarters and their stores you know, he's, he's saying, you know, these guys, they don't know what's proper on a man of war. They usually only travel on merchant men and they're treated as important people. And I'm thinking, OK, Fox, I'm starting to like you a little bit better. Yeah. And then Fox absolutely. is going to, you know, really he's trying to keep them in line, but he's going to try harder to do that. And, and interestingly, I think Jack was warming up like I was a little bit because Fox mentions that they appear to have stopped. And Jack says, well, yes, they've anchored for the night. And Jack throws him a nice little compliment. He says, I dare not go through the strait in the darkness, not carrying Caesar or at least Caesar's representative and all his fortune. And then Fox just glows. O'Brien tells us that Jack is delighted with Fox's unaffected, generous response. So I think, oh, this is just the note Fox has been waiting for. And Jack's been waiting for this note from Fox. Of, of, you know, It's like, oh, for a moment, they seem to come together here. <laughs> So we've got a couple of really interesting characters kind of blooming in front of us here. We, we've got Raffles, who has the reputation both of being a colonialist and an adventurer and an imperialist and a, you know, an imprisoner of people, but also as a, a, you know, a, a cultural and historical um, icon, bit of a dual character. And we've got Fox who's on the one hand, you know, with, with a bit of praise, is willing to be amenable and generous and open-minded, but also is a bit self-regarding. And both of these sound to me like extensions of Patrick O'Brien, you know, who was mm. had, had, had great notions of how we should be as human beings and, and wrote them really generously and glowingly in lots of his characters, but didn't always successfully represent those characteristics maybe in his own life. And he, maybe he's enjoying writing about these conflicted characters for that reason he sure might be i mean you know hearing about some of raffle's reforms and some of the things he was trying to do it made me every once in a while think about jefferson yeah you know, who seems to have been you know kind of a little bit for me anyways it was a point of reference to go yeah there are great men with great ideas who and like so many of us <laughs> often find that you know we we can't quite seem to practice them in our own lives a little bit. So who knows here? Yeah, and it certainly keeps you glued to the page. I mean, we're, we're interested in what's going to happen for Stephen's mission. We're a little bit interested in the naval side for Jack, but to be honest, it's mostly Stephen at the minute. I'm also interested in where Fox is going to end up and yes. these tensions in his character. Is he going to explode? Is he going to land on the positive side or on the negative side? Really fascinating, interesting little bit of tension in the story here. Yeah, it's too true, Ian. And it always brings out, and even more as, as we continue through this chapter and the next, you know, the tensions in ourselves, you know, or at least for me, you know, all these things that I think about. Well, you know, speaking of these tensions and characters, they, you know, O'Brien tells us that these old buggers continue to be a pain, often complaining to Lieutenant Fielding, but never to Jack. Ah, but the situation changes a little bit. Yeah, what what happens to kind of you know give them a bit of an attitude adjustment there? <laughs> yeah, th things are going to start to get complicated here. A really, uh, really potentially nerve shredding moment here. 
as they enter the South China Sea, so they've passed through the Straits, they're east of Java, they're approached by two large proas, these big Malay craft, likely pirates coming out to attack them. And then we talk about how they're filled with men and they're being very competently handled and they divide to go left and right either side of the Diane here. And Jack says, okay, we're going to get the guns ready to be run out, but keep the hands out of sight. Finally, just as the pros get close enough for it to start to come to a real potential clash here, the pirates in the pros get the idea that the Diane is a real man of war. They see that the gun ports are the real thing and not just painted on. She's not just a disguise merchant, so they break off. And I think my, this this sight of the danger and this sight also of Jack's resourcefulness in being ready to deal with piracy maybe changes a little bit the perception that the old buggers have, quiets their complaints, at least for a while. And just as the sailing is getting even more perilous and they're now leaving Muffet's reasonably well-charted course for even more dangerous, shallow, uncharted waters. Jack, therefore, is pretty glad that they've gone they're not in his face anymore they're not on deck anymore catching attention when they get to pull up a bank jack can do his seamanship without any distraction from them he comes into pull up a bank really slowly very genteel bit of leadership by jack and also a genteel bit of diplomacy he wants the crew to have plenty of time to do this confidently and safely he wants the people ashore in pull up to have plenty of time to prepare the appropriate greetings and get the protocol organized without anybody being caught out. Just as importantly, he's allowing himself and the ship's company to eat a leisurely breakfast. So, you know, all parts of the man are being nourished here. We like this. They're all gazing at the volcanic peak of the island. And remember, Polo Prabang is fictional. So on uh, Tom Horn's Cannonade.net website, we've just got a couple of purple dots somewhere in the middle of the ocean there where we think Polo Prabang might be somewhere near the equator. So we don't know if this is a real volcano that he has in mind or not. They all gaze at this volcanic peak. There are many other peaks and the large crater at sea level and the other crater up in the sky. They're headed into the first crater, the mile across, almost perfect circle crater that forms the harbour. And as Jack is looking at this layout here, he's reminded of Shelmerston, not because of the physical geography of the landscape or of the nature of the boats hauled up on the beach, but just this general air of piracy and kind of raffish degeneracy. They come into the middle of the channel, they drop anchor, while the water is deep enough for a, for a safe anchorage, they raise their colours and begin their salute. 13 guns. There's a prompt, well-spaced, gun-for-gun reply, just as Fox had predicted. Jack is very pleased that the answering guns there are swivels and not 18-pounders, so that he knows that he's going to have the whip hand if it does come to a, a gunnery versus gunnery contest, as has sometimes happened in the past, right, Mike? Right, right. If this all goes south, I'm glad to know we've got superior gunnery out here. Well, if, that, uh, that, that, that was a big deal back in the Ionian mission, dealing with all those exactly. renegade Turks. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what was in my head. Good. Well, sure enough, you know, they were wondering how they're going to be greeted and everything, especially with the French having arrived first. But a canoe heads out, a big one paddled by 20 men. There's a, you know, a middle hut, obviously, sheltering some important person. And in fact, the Sultan's vizier, Wanda, uh, comes aboard with appropriate ceremony. And as he's coming aboard, he bows to those on the quarterdeck, puts his hand quickly to his forehead and his heart. So very, you know, he's got kind of the local protocol and the ship's protocol. And his men are handing up these, you know, gifts, these baskets of fruit. He and Fox, you know, speak in melee. And then Fox introduces him and suggests that Fox and the vizier and, and Jack head down to drink coffee together in the cabin. Hmm. Again, very uh, redolent of, you know, Turkish officials and uh, the Ionian mission. Right. And just like with the Turks, uh, by the way, Turkey, a Muslim country, modern day Indonesia, where we are now also a, a Muslim country. So viziers and coffee drinking are an important part of the culture here. They drink coffee for a long old time. From time to time, they get Kilik or Ali coming with messages to prepare to get the boats, to get the gentlemen of the mission or their baggage ready to go ashore. And finally, after the crew in the ship and the boat has stopped talking to one another and given up hope, they did finally come out of the cabin. The vizier heads for shore, followed by the launch, the men from the mission, 
the, the old buggers, um, and their baggage and their servants. And after the next 13 gun salute, Jack turns to Stephen and says, well, we have delivered him at last. There were times when I thought we should never do it. And as Stephen, looking out and watching Fox stepping on shore, says, would there be any of that coffee left at all? I've been smelling it this last age and never a sip sent out. <laughs> oh, Stephen, I feel your pain. <laughs> Right. Oh my gosh. Nothing worse than being able to smell the coffee and not get at it. And and for Stephen, you know, certainly always in the middle of this, but now having to play his I'm just the captain's guest role, right? Yeah. Not in the middle of it here. Well, Jack tells Stephen that they had been expected. He's kind of relating the conversations they had in the in the cabin there, that the vizier has actually set aside a fair-sized house in its own compound, and it's prepared for the English mission on the east side of the river. There's a river that kind of you know, splits the town and, and comes down into the harbor there. The French have a similar compound on the other side of the river. He says that it's been arranged that everyone will have the first audience together with the Sultan once he returns at the turn of the moon. Stephen asks when that will be. And, and O'Brien writes, Jack looked at him. Even after so many proofs to the contrary, it was hard to believe that a man could remain ignorant of these fundamental things. But such was the case. And he said, not unkindly, in five days time, brother. You know, Jack, who kind of lives and dies by the moon and the tides and everything else. And he's thinking, Stephen, how long have you been at sea? And you don't know when the moon's going to change. But, you, you know, you know, every atom of, of the anatomy of every creature on, the, on God's green earth. here, right? Yeah. And it's absolutely true. You don't need to know very much about tide tables if you can look up and know where the moon is and know when it's full and when it's not. Nice. Oh, very good. So, uh, Stephen, we're, we're going to go back with Stephen in his, into his more natural area of competency here. Uh, he finds Lin Liang's inconspicuous house in an area of shabby warehouses not far from Fox's compound. Stephen lines up standing behind people who are buying beetle and two of the Diane's crew who are changing money with help from one of Fox's servants to go and buy some companionship. Yeah, we know what kind of companionship they mean uh, somewhere on the island. And asking for Lin, Stephen is led a good way through the shop into a courtyard between warehouses to an enclosed garden with a garden house and a round door in which Lin Yang stood bowing repeatedly. So clearly the message has got there that Stephen's a man of some substance. Um, Lin seats Stephen on a great chair and serves refreshments. He apologizes that he has not yet brought together all of the money named in Xiao Yen's note, even with the help of his colleague Wu Han on the other side of the river and like we remember that the French are on the other side of the river as well. So mm, stick a pin in that. However, says Lin, he's arranged everything he has so far on multiple currencies and in silver, which is more current than gold as a currency in the region. And Stephen listens to all the numbers, watches the abacus fly as Lin is calculating and reckoning up here and tells them he'll make considerable transfers soon and asks if Wuhan understands the importance of confidentiality. This is the guy who's on the other side of the river in proximity to the French. And Lin says, Wuhan is the soul of discretion, as silent as the legendary Mo. So, who is the legendary? Is this Maurice Chevalier or is this somebody else? Who Who is right. this legendary Mo? <laughs> you know, I, I, I have... Absolutely no idea. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a swing at it. So readers, listeners, if you guys know about the legendary Mo, let me know. Now, with Steven in the scene, I'm thinking, you know, this has got this. This could be not a person, but something else. And sure enough, in Chinese zoology, the character Mo, it's the standard Chinese name for the giant panda. And, you know, it stayed that way from kind of like the third century BCE till, till the 19th century. But interestingly, in 1824, uh, there was a Frenchman who studies the Orient who mistakenly identified Mo as the recently discovered black and white Malayan taper. But that never inhabited China in historical times. Now, interestingly, some of these things look like they're kind of colored like a panda. But 
he was basing his misidentifications on Chinese woodblock illustrations that depicted a different Mo, uh, a different kind of ancient Chinese Mo, which is a chimera, an animal mixture that has an elephant trunk, rhinoceros eyes, a cow tail, and tiger paws. So mm. we've got these, you know, is it is there some tale about a discretionary giant panda in ancient China? Is there is this related to the chimera? You know, this animal made of different parts. Is there a tale about that? And is this just O'Brien having fun with us because of the French connection to the melee taper to Mo? Um, all of this happening about the same time here. So I'm kind of fascinated by this here. Again, I could kind of hear uh, O'Brien chuckling over our shoulders as I was you know, going wild trying to research who the legendary <laughs> Mo is. Might have been a legend in O'Brien's mind, given some of this history here. Just brilliantly done. But please, listeners, if you got any information, this is one where I, I really came up dry other than this stretch here. Fantastic. And then Stephen asks outright, is Wuhan, in fact, the banker for the French mission? Mm. And Lin says he is not. He sometimes changes a little money for them. But Wuhan's Pondicherry clock has a connection and a man belonging to the mission, also from French India. And Stephen says, well, in that case, I'm willing to pay for any information about the French that can be properly given with discretion. And he's turning a potential risk, which is that Wuhan is actually lined up with the French, into an opportunity here, which it sounds like classic intelligence maneuvering by Stephen. There's this risk. I can't do anything about it, but let me see if I can use that to get a, a channel through the back door into some information about what's happening in the French camp here. Lynn suggests that on future visits, Dr. Maturin should come through the door named Discretion. <laughs> it's great, great that the door has a name. He says it's behind the hovel in which he and his miserable family had their unworthy being. And knowing a little bit about courteous oriental manners, I'm sure that means it's behind my beautiful house where my gorgeous wife and my lovely family live. Exactly. Yeah. And Wuhan leads Stephen down through a beautiful court filled with orchids, then to one with a high wall and a rounded projection with a spy hole looking at the low iron door, which opens onto a path along a neglected canal. And Mike, I've got this really strong visual in my head of kind of peering through this gap and seeing the trail ahead. We're in the midst of the very murky, seedy commercial part of town. All these possibilities of, you know, doors, some of them real, some of them illusory, all opening up in front of Stephen. This is turning into a very Stephen kind of a scene here. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I had in mind, you know, back streets in Berlin with a little yeah. fog in the nighttime. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is this is real spy novel kind of thing here with these, you know, the doors, the, the possibilities for double and triple agents working here. It's really fascinating here. Yeah, we, we need some zither music in the background. <laughs> right, right. That's right, right, right. Well, you know, it's it's interesting here. So, so it seems like, you know, as we're saying, it's setting up as a spy story. But now we've got we got lots of people on shore here. Yeah, and Stephen started to accumulate allies and potential helpers. We have the old buggers. We have Raffles back in uh, Batavia. We have Van Buren. We have Lin Liang as an ally. We have Wu Han. We don't know whether he's an ally or the opposite. How many of these can Stephen count on? How are they going to help him? Surely, meanwhile, Mike, the, the French are making the same preparations on their side, and maybe that's the Wu Han connection. They also have Ray and Ledwood with them too. Yeah. And so, you know, what's going to happen when they all finally meet the Sultan? You know, what else in, in all of Eastern philosophy and culture and science and nature is Stephen going to encounter? You know, and how far is O'Brien going to take us into this picture of a mystical interconnected world for Stephen to navigate. Mm. You know, you said earlier, Ian, you know, this is harkens back to the Ionian mission here. So we know about intrigue. We know that this could get really ugly. On the other hand, we've watched Stephen in other hands, you know, politically pulling things off with, with no violence at all and stuff. And this is this is going to be a fascinating one. I, you know, I really, really wonder where is O'Brien taking us next. It's certainly not to South America. No, it's not. 
Well, Mike, I think we need to turn another page. We're still not quite done with chapter six, but I think this is a great moment to say, what do you say next week to just a little bit more Oriental Patrick O'Brien? Oh, I would like that of all things. Duplessis, stick a pin in his name, the leader Duplessis has been removed from the harbour. Sorry, no, he hasn't been removed from the harbour. <laughs> All right, Sam, you got a couple to pick from early on. Oh, <laughs> we, yeah, we've each yeah, got yeah. a few blows here, but I love it. Well done. I shall take another swig of my Singapore sling and take another go at that. <laughs>